Book 3. The sacred sun, above the waters raised, through heaven's eternal brazen portals blazed, and wide over earth diffused his cheering ray, to gods and men to give the golden day. Now on the coast of Pyle the vessel falls, before old Neleus' venerable walls, there suppliant to the monarch of the flood, at nine green theatres the Pylians stood, each held five hundred, a deputed train. At each, nine oxen on the sand lay slain, they taste the entrails, and the altars load, with smoking thighs, an offering to the god. Full for the port the Ithacansians stand, and furl their sails, and issue on the land. Telemachus already pressed the shore, not first, the power of wisdom marched before, and ere the sacrificing throng he joined, admonished thus his well-attending mind, Proceed, my son, this youthful shame expel, an honest business never blush to tell, to learn what fates thy wretched sire detain, we pass the wide immeasurable main, meet then the senior far renowned for sense, with reverent awe, but decent confidence, urge him with truth to frame his fair replies, and sure he will, for wisdom never lies. Oh tell me, mentor, tell me, faithful guide, the youth with prudent modesty replied. How shall I meet, or how accost the sage, unskilled in speech, nor yet mature of age? Awful thy approach, and hard the task appears, to question wisely men of riper years to whom the martial goddess thus rejoined. Search, for some thoughts, thy own suggesting mind, and others, dictated by heavenly power, shall rise spontaneous in the needful hour. For naught unprosperous, shall thy ways attend, born with good omens, and with heaven thy friend. She spoke, and led the way with swiftest speed. As swift, the youth pursued the way she led and joined the band before the sacred fire, where sate, encompassed with his sons, the sire, the youth of Pylos, some on pointed wood, transfixed the fragments, some prepared the food, in friendly throngs they gather to embrace, their unknown guests, and at the banquet place, Pisistratus, was first to grasp their hands, and spread soft hides upon the yellow sands, Along the shore the illustrious pair he led, where Nestor sate with youthful thrasimed, to each a portion of the feast he bore, and held the golden goblet foaming over, then first approaching to the elder guest, the latent goddess in these words addressed, Whoever thou art, whom fortune brings to keep, these rites of Neptune, monarch of the deep, thee first it fits, O stranger, to prepare, the due libation and the solemn prayer. Then give thy friend to shed the sacred wine, though much thy younger, and his years like mine. He too, I deem, implores the power divine. For all mankind alike require their grace, all born to want, a miserable race. He spake, and to her hand preferred the bowl. A secret pleasure touched Athena's soul, to see the preference due to sacred age regarded ever by the just and sage. Of ocean's king she then implores the grace, O thou, whose arms this ample globe embrace, fulfill our wish, and let thy glory shine. On Nestor first, and Nestor's royal line, next grant the Pylian states their just desires, pleased with their hecatombs ascending fires. Last, deign Telemachus and me to bless and crown our voyage with desired success. Thus she, and having paid the right divine, gave to Ulysses' son the rosy wine. Suppliant he prayed, and now the victims dressed. They draw, divide, and celebrate the feast. The banquet done, the narrative old man. Thus mild, the pleasing conference began. Now gentle guests, the genial banquet over, it fits to ask ye, what your native sure, and whence your race, on what adventure say, thus far you wander through the watery way, relative business, or the thirst of gain, 
Engage your journey over the pathless main, where savage pirates seek through seas unknown, the lives of others, venturous of their own, urged by the precepts by the goddess given, and filled with confidence infused from heaven, the youth, whom Pallas destined to be wise, and famed among the sons of men, replies, Inquirest thou, father, from what coast we came, O grace and glory of the Grecian name, from where high Ithaca overlooks the floods, brown with overarching shades and pendant woods, us to these shores our filial duty draws, a private sorrow, not a public cause, my sire I seek, wherever the voice of fame, has told the glories of his noble name, the great Ulysses, famed from shore to shore, for valour much, for hardy suffering more, long time with thee before proud Ilion's wall, in arms he fought, with thee beheld her fall, of all the chiefs, this hero's fate alone, has Jove reserved, unheard of, and unknown, whether in fields by hostile fury slain, or sunk by tempests in the gulfy main, of this to learn, oppressed with tender fears, lo, at thy knee his suppliant son appears, if all thy certain eye, or curious ear, have learnt his fate, the whole dark story clear, and, oh, whatever heaven destined to betide, let neither flattery soothe, nor pity hide, prepare I stand, he was but born to try, the lot of man, to suffer, and to die, oh then, if ever through the ten years war, the wise, the good Ulysses claimed thy care, if ever he joined thy counsel, or thy sword, true in his deed, and constant to his word, far as thy mind through backward time can see, search all thy stores of faithful memory, tis sacred truth I ask, and ask of thee, to him experienced, Nestor thus rejoined, O friend, what sorrows dost thou bring to mind, shall I the long, laborious scene review, and open all the wounds of Greece anew, what toils by sea, where dark in quest of prey, dauntless we roved, Achilles led the way, what toils by land, where mixed in fatal fight, such numbers fell, such heroes sunk to night, their Ajax great, Achilles there the brave, their wise Patroclus, fill early grave, there, too, my son, ah, once my best delight, once swift of foot, and terrible in fight, in whom stern courage with soft virtue joined, a faultless body, and a blameless mind, Antilochus, what more can I relate, how trace the tedious series of our fate, not added years on years my task could close, the long historian of my country's woes, back to thy native islands mightest thou sail, and leave half heard the melancholy tale. Nine painful years on that detested shore, what stratagems we formed, what toils we bore, still labouring on, till scarce at last we found, great Jove propitious, and our conquest crowned. Far over the rest thy mighty father shined, in wit, in prudence, and in force of mind. Art thou the son of that illustrious sire? With joy I grasp thee, and with love admire, so like your voices, and your words so wise, who finds the younger must consult his eyes, thy sire and I were one, nor varied aught, in public sentence, or in private thought, alike to counsel or the assembly came, with equal souls, and sentiments the same, but when, by wisdom won, proud Ilion burned, and in their ships the conquering Greeks returned. T'was God's high will victors to divide, and turn the event, confounding human pride, some he destroyed, some scattered as the dust, not all were prudent, and not all were just. Then discord, sent by Pallas from above, stern daughter of the great avenger Jove, the brother kings inspired with fell debate, who called to counsel all the Achaean state, but called untimely, not the sacred rite, observed, nor heedful of the setting light, 
nor heralds sword the session to proclaim. Sour with debauch, a reeling tribe they came. To these the cause of meeting they explain. And Menelaus moves to cross the main. Not so the king of men, he willed to stay. The sacred rites and hecatombs to pay. And calm Minerva's wrath, O oh blind to fate. The gods not likely change their love, or hate. With ireful taunts each other they oppose. Till in loud tumult all the Greeks arose. Now different counsels every breast divide. Each burns with rancor to the adverse side. The unquiet night strange projects entertained. So Jove, that urged us to our fate, ordained. We with the rising mourn our ships and moored. And brought our captives and our stores aboard. But half the people with respect obeyed. The king of men, and at his bidding stayed. Now on the wings of winds our course we keep. For God has smoothed the waters of the deep. For Tenedos we spread our eager oars. Their land, and pay due victims to the powers. To bless our safe return, we join in prayer. But angry Jove dispersed our vows in air. And raised new discord. Then, so heaven decreed. Ulysses first and Nestor disagreed. Wise as he was, by various counsels swayed. He there, though late, to please the monarch, stayed. But I, determined, stem the foamy floods. Warned of the coming fury of the gods. With us, Tydides feared, and urged his haste. And Menelaus came, but came the last. He joined our vessels in the lesbian bay. While yet we doubted of our watery way. If to the right to urge the pilot's toil. The safer road, beside the Syrian isle. Or the straight course to rocky Chios plow. And anchor under Mimas' shaggy brow. We sought direction of the power divine. The god propitious gave the guiding sign. Through the mid seas he bid our navy steer. And in Evia shun the woes we fear. The whistling winds already waked the sky. Before the whistling winds the vessels fly. With rapid swiftness cut the liquid way. And reach Gerastus at the point of day. Their hecatombs of bulls, to Neptune slain. High flaming please the monarch of the main. The fourth day shone, when all their labors over. Tydides' vessels touched the wished-for shore. But I to Pylos scud before the gales. The god still breathing on my swelling sails. Separate from all, I safely landed here. Their fates or fortunes never reached my ear. Yet what I learned, attend, as here I sat. And asked each voyager each hero's fate. Curious to know, and willing to relate. Safe reached the Myrmidons their native land. Beneath Achilles' warlike son's command. Those, whom the heir of great Apollo's art. Brave Philoctetes, taught to wing the dart. And those whom I domin from Ilion's plain. Had led, securely crossed the dreadful main. How Agamemnon touched his Argive coast and how his life by fraud and force he lost, and how the murderer paid his forfeit breath, what lands so distant from that scene of death, but trembling heard the fame, and heard, admire, how well the son appeased his slaughtered sire, even to the unhappy, that unjustly bleed, heaven gives posterity, to avenge the deed, so fell Aegisthus, and mayest thou, my friend, on whom the virtues of thy sire descend. Make future times thy equal act adore, and be what brave Orestes was before. The prudent youth replied, O thou the grace, and lasting glory of the Grecian race. Just was the vengeance, and to latest days. Shall long posterity resound the praise. Some god this arm with equal prowess bless, and the proud suitors shall its force confess. Injurious men, who while my soul is sore, of fresh affronts, are meditating more. But heaven denies this honor to my hand, nor shall my father repossess the land. The father's fortune never to return, and the sad sons to softer and to mourn. Thus he, and Nestor took the word, my son. Is it then true, as distant rumors run, 
that crowds of rivals for thy mother's charms, thy palace fill with insults and alarms. Say, is the fault, through tame submission, thine? Or leagued against thee, do thy people join? Moved by some oracle, or voice divine? And yet who knows, but ripening lies in fate? An hour of vengeance for the afflicted state, when great Ulysses shall suppress these harms, Ulysses singly, or all Greece in arms. But if Athena, war's triumphant maid, the happy son will as the father aid, whose fame and safety was her constant care, in every danger and in every war, never on man did heavenly favor shine, with rays so strong, distinguished and divine, as those with which Minerva marked thy sire, so might she love thee, so thy soul inspire. Soon should their hopes in humble dust be laid, and long oblivion of the bridal bed. Ah! No such hope, the prince with sighs replies, can touch my breast, that blessing heaven denies. Even by celestial favor were it given, fortune or fate would cross the will of heaven. What words are these, and what imprudence thine? Thus interposed the martial maid divine. Forgetful youth. But no, the power above. With ease can save each object of his love. Wide as his will, extends his boundless grace. Nor lost in time nor circumscribed by place. Happier his lot, who, many sorrows past. Long laboring gains his natal shore at last. Than who, too speedy, hastes to end his life by some stern ruffian, or adulterous wife. Death only is the lot which none can miss. And all is possible to heaven but this. The best, the dearest favorite of the sky. Must, taste that cup, for man is born to die. Thus checked, replied Ulysses' prudent heir. Mentor, no more, the mournful thought forbear. For he no more must draw his country's breath already snatched by fate, and the black doom of death. Pass we to other subjects, and engage. On themes remote the venerable sage, who thrice has seen the perishable kind, of men decay, and through three ages shined, like gods majestic, and like gods in mind, for much he knows, and just conclusions draws, from various precedents, and various laws. O son of Neleus, Awful Nestor, tell. How he, the mighty Agamemnon, fell. By what strange fraud Aegisthus wrought, relate. By force he could not, such a hero's fate. Live Menelaus not in Greece. Or where? Was then the martial brother's pious care. Condemned perhaps some foreign shore to tread. Or sure Aegisthus had not dared the deed. To whom the full of days, illustrious youth. Attend, though partly thou hast guessed, the truth. For had the martial Menelaus found, the ruffian breathing yet on Argive ground, nor earth had bid his carcass from the skies, nor Grecian virgins shrieked his obsequies, but fowls obscene dismembered his remains, and dogs had torn him on the naked plains, while as the works of bloody Mars employed, the wanton youth in glorious peace enjoyed. He stretched at ease in Argos' calm recess, whose stately steeds luxuriant pastures bless. With flatteries insinuating art, soothed the frail queen, and poisoned all her heart. At first, with worthy shame and decent pride, the royal dame his lawless suit denied, for virtue's image yet possessed her mind, taught by a master of the tuneful kind, a treatise, parting for the Trojan War, consigned the youthful consort to his care. True to his charge, the bard preserved her long. In honor's limits, such the power of song. But when the gods these objects of their hate, dragged to destruction by the links of fate, the bard they banished from his native soil, and left all helpless in a desert isle. There he, the sweetest of the sacred train, sung dying to the rocks, but sung in vain. Then virtue was no more, her guard away. She fell, to lust a voluntary prey, 
even to the temple stalked the adulterous spouse, with impious thanks, and mockery of the vows, with images, with garments, and with gold, and odorous fumes from loaded altars rolled. Meantime from flaming Troy we cut the way, with Menelaus, through the curling sea. But when to Sunium's sacred point we came, crowned with the temple of the Athenian dame, a tribe's pilot, Frontes, there expired. Frontes, of all the songs of men and mired, to steer the bounding bark with steady toil. When the storm thickens, and the billows boil, while yet he exercised the steerman's art, Apollo touched him with his gentle dart. Even with the rudder in his hand, he fell, to pay whole honors to the shades of hell. We checked our haste, by pious office bound, and laid our old companion in the ground. And now the rites discharged, our course we keep, far on the gloomy bosom of the deep. Soon as Malai's misty tops arise, sudden the thunderer blackens all the skies, and the winds whistle, and the surges roll, mountains on mountains, and obscure the pole. The tempest scatters, and divides our fleet. Part, the storm urges on the coast of Crete, where winding round the rich Sidonian plain, the streams of Jardin issue to the main. There stands a rock, high, eminent and steep, whose shaggy brow overhangs the shady deep, and views Gortina on the western side. On this rough oyster drove the impetuous tide, with broken force the billows rolled away, and heaved the fleet into the neighboring bay. Thus, saved from death, they gained the Feistan shores, with shattered vessels and disabled oars, but five tall barks the winds and water tossed. Far from their fellows, on the Egyptian coast, there wandered Menelaus through foreign shores, amassing gold, and gathering naval stores, while cursed Aegisius the detested deed, by fraud fulfilled, and his great brother bled. Seven years, the traitor rich Mycenae swayed, and his stern rule the groaning land obeyed. The eighth, from Athens to his realm restored, Orestes brandished the avenging sword, slew the dire pair, and gave to funeral flame, the vile assassin and adulterous dame. That day, ere yet the bloody triumphs cease, returned Atreides to the coast of Greece, and safe to Argos port his navy brought, with gifts of price and ponderous treasure fraught. Hence warned, my son, beware, nor idly stand, too long a stranger to thy native land, lest heedless absence wear thy wealth away, while lawless feasters in thy palace away, perhaps may seize thy realm, and share the spoil, and though return, with disappointed toil, from thy vain journey, to a rifled isle. However, my friend, indulge one labor more, and seek a treedes on the Spartan shore. He, wandering long a wider circle made, and many languaged nations has surveyed, and measured tracks unknown to other ships, amid the monstrous wonders of the deeps, a length of ocean and unbounded sky, which scarce the sea fowl in a year overfly, go then, to Sparta take the watery way, thy ship and sailors but for orders stay, or, if my land then choose thy course to bend, my steeds, my chariots, and my songs, attend, thee to Atreides they shall safe convey, guides of thy road, companions of thy way, urge him with truth to frame his wise replies, and sure he will, for Menelaus is wise, Thus while he speaks the ruddy sun descends, and twilight grey her evening shade extends. Then thus the blue-eyed maid, O full of days, wise are thy words, and just are all thy ways. Now immolate the tongues, and mix the wine, sacred to Neptune and the powers divine. The lamp of day is quenched beneath the deep, and soft approach the balmy hours of sleep nor fits it to prolong the heavenly feast, timeless, indecent, but retire to rest. So spake Jove's daughter, the celestial maid, the sober train attended and obeyed, 
the sacred heralds on their hands around, poured the full urns, the youths the goblets crowned. From bowl to bowl the homely beverage flows, while to the final sacrifice they rose, the tongues they cast upon the fragrant flame, and pour, above, the consecrated stream. And now, their thirst by copious draughts allayed, the youthful hero and the Athenian maid, proposed departure from the finished rite, and in their hollow bark to pass the night. But this hospitable sage denied. Forbid it, Jove! And all the gods, he cried. Thus from my walls and the much-loved son to send, of such a hero, and of such a friend, me, as some needy peasant, would he leave, whom heaven denies the blessing to relieve, me would he leave, who boast imperial sway, when beds of royal state invite your stay, no, long as life this mortal shall inspire, or as my children imitate their sire, here shall the wandering stranger find his home, and hospitable rites adorn the dome. Well hast thou spoke, the blue-eyed maid replies. Beloved old man, benevolent as wise, be the kind dictates of thy heart obeyed, and let thy words Telemachus persuade. He to thy palace shall thy steps pursue, I to the ship, to give the orders due, prescribe directions and confirm the crew for I alone sustain their naval cares, who boast experience from these silver hairs, all youths the rest, whom to this journey move, like years, like tempers, and their prince's love, there in the vessel shall I pass the night, and, soon as morning paints the fields of light, I go to challenge from the corkons bold, a debt, contracted in the days of old, but this, thy guest, Received with friendly care, let thy strong coursers, swift to Sparta bear, prepare thy chariot at the dawn of day, and be thy son companion of his way. Then, turning with the word, Minerva flies, and soars an eagle through the liquid skies. Vision divine, the thronged spectators gaze, in holy wonder fixed, and still amaze. But chief the reverend sage admired, he took the hand of young Telemachus, and spoke. O, oh, happy youth! And favoured of the skies! Distinguished care of guardian deities, whose early years for future worth engage. No vulgar manhood, no ignoble age. For lo! None other of the course above. Then she, the daughter of almighty Jove, Pallas herself, the war triumphant maid, confessed is thine, as once thy father's aid. So guide me, goddess. So propitious shine. On me, my consort, and my royal line. A yearling bullock to thy name shall smoke. Untamed, unconscious of the galling yoke. With ample forehead, and yet tender horns. Whose budding honours ductile gold adorns. Submissive thus the hoary sire preferred. His holy vow, the favouring goddess heard. Then, slowly rising, over the sandy space, proceeds the father, followed by his race. A long procession, timely marching home, in comely order to the regal dome. There when arrived, on thrones around him placed, his sons and grandsons the wide circle graced. To these the hospitable sage, in sign, of social welcome, mixed the racy wine late from the mellowing cask restored to light, by ten long years refined, and rosy bright, to palace high the foaming bowl he crowned, and sprinkled large libations on the ground, each drinks a full oblivion of his cares, and to the gifts of balmy sleep repairs, deep in a rich alcove the prince was laid, and slept beneath the pompous colonnade, fast by his side Pisistratus was spread, in age his equal, on a splendid bed, but in an inner court, securely closed, the reverend Nestor and his queen reposed, when now Aurora, daughter of the dawn, with rosy luster purpled over the lawn, the old man early rose, walked forth, and sate, on polished stone before his palace gate, 
with ungents smooth the lucid marble shone, where ancient Neleus sate, a rustic throne, but he descending to the infernal shade, sage Nestor filled it, and the scepter swayed, his sons around him mild obeisance pay, and duteous take the orders of the day, first Echephron and Stratius quit their bed, then Perseus, Aretus, and Thrasymed, the last Pisistratus arose from rest. They came, and near him placed the stranger guest. To these the senior thus declared his will. My sons, the dictates of your sire fulfill. To Pallas, first of gods, prepare the feast. Who graced our rites, a more than mortal guest. Let one, dispatchful, bid some swain to lead. A well-fed bullock from the grassy mead. One seek the harbour where the vessels moor, and bring thy friends, Telemachus, ashore. Leave only to the galley to attend, another Larsaeus must we send. Artist divine, whose skilful hands enfold, the victim's horn with circumphacile gold, the rest may hear the pious duty share, and bid the handmaids for the feast prepare, the seats to range, the fragrant wood to bring and limpid waters, from the living spring. He said, and busy each his care bestowed. Already at the gates the bullock load. Already came the Ithacensian crew. The dexterous smith the tools already drew. His ponderous hammer and his anvil sound. And the strong tongs to turn the metal round. Nor was Minerva absent from the right. She viewed her honours, and enjoyed the sight. With reverend hand the king presents the gold, which round the entorted horns the gilder rolled, so wrought as Pallas might with pride behold. Young Aretas from forth his bridal bower, brought the full lava over their hands to pour, and canisters of consecrated flower, Stratius and Echephron the victim led. The axe was held by warlike Thrasymed. In act to strike, before him Perseus stood the vase extending to receive the blood. The king himself initiates to the power, scatters with quivering hand the sacred flower, and the stream sprinkles, from the curling brows. The hair collected in the fire he throws, soon as due vows on every part were paid, and sacred wheat upon the victim laid. Strong Thrasymed discharged the speeding blow, full on his neck, and cut the nerves in two. Down sunk the heavy beast, the females round. Maids, wives, and matrons, mix a shrilling sound. Nor scorned the queen the holy choir to join. The firstborn she, of old Climinus line. In youth by Nestor loved, of spotless fame. And loved in age, Eurydice her name. From earth they rear him, struggling now with death and Nestor's youngest stops the vents of breath. The soul for ever flies, on all sides round. Streams the black blood, and smokes upon the ground. The beast they then divide and disunite. The ribs and limbs, observant of the right. On these, in double calls involved with art. The choicest morsels lay from every part. The sacred sage before his altar stands turns the burnt offering with his holy hands, and pours the wine, and bids the flames aspire. The youth with instruments, surround the fire, the thighs now sacrificed, and entrails dressed. The assistants part, transfix, and broil the rest. While these officious tend the rites divine, the last fair branch of the Nestorian line, sweet Polycasti, took the pleasing toil, to bathe the prince, and pour the fragrant oil. Over his fair limbs a flowery vest he threw, and issued, like a god, to mortal view. His former seat beside the king he found. His people's father with his peers around, all placed at ease the holy banquet join. And in the dazzling goblet laughs the wine. The rage of thirst and hunger now suppressed. The monarch turns him to his royal guest and for the promised journey bids prepare, the smooth-haired horses, and the rapid car, observant of his word, the word scarce spoke, the sons obey, 
and join them to the yoke. Then bread and wine a ready handmaid brings, and presents, such as suit the state of kings. The glittering seat Telemachus ascends, his faithful guide Pisistratus attends. With hasty hand the ruling reins he drew, he lashed the coursers, and the coursers flew. Beneath the bounding yoke alike they hold, their equal pace, and smoked along the field. The towers of Pylos sink, its views decay. Fields after fields fly back, till close of day. Then sunk the sun, and darkened all the way. To Furry now, Diocles' stately seat. Of Alpheus' race, the weary youths retreat. His house affords the hospitable rite. And pleased they sleep, the blessing of the night. But when Aurora, daughter of the dawn, with rosy luster purpled over the lawn. Again they mount, their journey to renew. And from the sounding portico they flew. Along the waving fields their way they hold. The fields receding as their chariot rolled. Then slowly sunk the ruddy globe of light. And over the shaded landscape rushed the night.